Hello. Alright, so first thing first, Happy New Year. I know I'm kinda late, but hey, you can never have enough Happy New Years. So Happy New Year! Today I'm going to be answering questions. Well, I technically asked you to ask me some questions, so today's the day that I'm going to answer them. So the first question is from Ko. Is there a backstory in every song? The thing about stories or meaning in songs is, um, let's say you're making a track. The fact that you got inspired is already considered as you came up with some sort of small story or meaning to what you're about to make. Which basically means that the thing that you're about to make has already some sort of meaning to it. However, if you're not willing to waste the extra time to develop that inspiration that you got, it becomes meaningless. That's how I feel about it at least. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know? Most people that are famous nowadays used to make tracks that aren't like super deep or anything. And most EDM music producers are heavily influenced by that, including myself. I mean, it's cool to listen to and there's nothing wrong with that. But after years of making music, I started to think that connecting with your own music is a little more exciting than just making them. And it was around the time when I heard about Porter's album Worlds, the album that changed the way I see music. It wasn't just about the sounds anymore, it's like there was something more to it and he actually took the extra time to develop his own inspiration when he was making that album that's one of the reason why it's such an iconic album that changed a lot of people's life because of that and i'm going to try to go that route with my future songs including adventures of course second question by naito music how to make fat bass well, there's a lot of ways you can make your bass sound fat. Well, usually by using compression and distortion. And this is how you do it. By first adding an EQ on your bass. And then you boost the low end of that EQ around 100 Hz. And then after that, you add a saturator. In this example, I'm going to be using Wave Shaper. And I just did this. And then an OTT. So this is how the sound sounds by itself. This is how it sounds with the EQ, bass boosted, and then this is how it sounds with the wave shaper. Already it's distorting the low frequencies, which makes it feel fatter, and then an OTT. And of course, it's like based on these three, but you can go ahead and experiment more. Yeah, next question is by Lamp Spaghetti. Is there a step-by-step -step way to learn sound design so that you don't waste much time? I really like your sound designs. Th thank you. Thank you. And yes, there is actually. And I wish I followed those steps earlier. Bruh. First is get a synth and make sure that you get used to that one synth. Second, getting used to how basic waveforms sound like sine wave, triangle wave, square wave, and saw wave. Third is getting used to how basic effects sound like. Filters, phasers, compression, distortion, etc. There's a lot. There's a lot of filter types, for example, so learning them is crucial. Fourth is combining them to get complex sounds, because it's all about the interactions, really. The thing that I suggest you is to look for terms. Don't chase after like fancy plugins or anything like that. That's a huge waste of time. Just learn the terms instead. So when you hear something like a saw wave with high pass with high resonance, with saturation, you can just go like... Fifth, you can go the resampling route now that you've learned some basics. Resampling is basically recording a sound that you made or any sound, then stretching it, slowing it down, or speeding it up like crazy by using different stretching algorithms, then applying post effects on them again. 
and then repeat the process. The cool thing about resampling is you can just do the same thing over and over again and most of the time you're gonna get cool sounds. You're basically taking advantage of various stretching algorithms artifacts because when you're stretching things too much, it's gonna sound weird depending on what algorithm you chose. You accentuate those artifacts with post effect and you get cool stuff. I recommend you watch Laxity's live streams for that. He doesn't go like insanely crazy like Virtual Red, but he does simple resampling most of the time from streams that I've seen at least. Sixth, layering. Layering is really easy. It's just combining sounds. Well, you can make a boring sound sound cool with other sounds. Combining textures, basically. So let's say you have this sound. Actually, this sound. That's the sound, and this is basically the same exact sound, just pitched one octave, as you can see here. This is one, this is pitched one octave. That's a sound, it's boring, it's a boring super saw. And then I added this. This is just a pad sound. Adds a little bit of texture. And then this. A weird sound. Again, for extra texture. Now it sounds like this. And this is just a sparkly sound that I made from Traveler. And already, this is how it sounds before. Effortless layering. Amazing. And of course, you can mix them. So you can be like, I, I want to remove the low of that one. You can also remove the highs. If you don't want that sound to be more present on the highs, and you can be like, the pad can just be on the mids, and the sparkle can be on the highs. And this is how it sounds now. Seventh is have fun. It feels amazing when you twist knobs and the sound changes. You can literally have a session where you, you just make weird sounds. It's almost like a therapy session, not caring about anything like mixes or song arrangement or anything like that, just twisting knobs. Next question is from Anomalies. How to make a Reese bass a filler one? Well, those are pretty easy to make actually. All you need is a super distorted detuned saw wave. And when you're doing the pitch band thing, like the wham, you modulate the high pass and the detune and you get the Next question is from Just Random Gamer. I got to know about you from your skillfully crafted remakes of a lot of Porter Robinson songs. How does remaking a song help you improve your skills as a music producer? It does help a lot, I couldn't believe it myself. If you've been making music for a while, surely you've developed some sort of habits, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And you know, that's fine, you can keep doing stuff your way and eventually you'll get somewhere. But remaking stuff is just a whole new world. It's like you're diving into someone else's brain, which is weird because most of what they're doing is almost the complete opposite of what your habits are, which is a good thing. You get to learn new stuff. For example, on my last Nurture remake, which is Sweet Time, I've noticed a lot of stuff happening in the mids, mono, and the sides, stereo. Like, it's very clever the way he mixed it. I've made a breakdown video about that, actually. You can check it up here. But to keep it short, I finally realized that things on the mids are actually the things that you hear, and things on the sides are just decorations. And you may be like, duh. Of course, but the thing that blew my mind was, it's controlled. And that is really hard to do. After that remake, I started to use a lot of mid-side EQs on my mixes. So yeah, you do learn a lot by remaking stuff. Guys, by the way, by the way, Graf is doing the funny. Please subscribe, I love you. Okay, back to the video. Next question is from Blask Wu. Would like to know a little bit about the releasing process, how things work as a self-producer rather than a labeled one. And if a person is planning on starting a self-producer career, what advice would you give? Maybe start a YouTube channel like you did or anything you would like to share about your own experiences during your adventure. Hmm. 
The releasing process wasn't really mind-blowingly unbelievable or anything. I tried to finish every song as early as possible while still making sure that the quality of each song is above average. It is possible to work that way. You just gotta focus and not get distracted easily by YouTube videos or memes. And even if you have a terrible sleep schedule, it is still possible. Finishing the songs wasn't the real struggle though, it was the artworks. As of right now, I'm still learning on how to properly use Blender. I still rely on tutorials a lot, but I do have a rough understanding on how things works a little bit, so that's good. On the marketing side of things, I kept it very simple, but enough to give people an actual reason to listen to it. I couldn't think outside of the box on this one, mainly because I'm still kind of new to it. Knowing myself, I feel like I can always adjust and do better next time, and I will. Being a self-producer is amazing. You have so much control over everything you do. Not that I have anything against labeled producer or anything like that. The reason I didn't choose that way was mainly because of insecurity. I don't know, but I feel like there's always some sort of standard to be met in order to be on a label, and that's the thing that confuses me a lot. Sometimes it seems like labels want creative stuff, but your own perspective of what's creative doesn't always align with theirs. You know what? Or maybe I just gave up on it a while ago, so now I, I have no idea what's up with that anymore. Or maybe I'm just too scared to try. I do not like generalizing at all, I still believe that there is some genuine label out there. Truth be told, I want one of my songs to be published on a label one day, that would be really cool, I just need time to think about it. If you want to be a self-producer, I'd say starting a YouTube channel is the best option, or one of the best. Oh, and also, get ready to do things that you've never done before, like scheduling everything that you do. Of course, you're gonna still mess up, but as long as it's not big, then you're good. Time efficiency starts to matter. It requires a lot of learning, video editing, speaking correctly, coming up with video ideas, 3D stuff if you wanna do your own artworks, marketing, and of course, expanding your scale as a music producer. You're basically going to be working five times as hard since you're doing everything yourself. The thing is though, you get to learn a lot of new stuff, so that's always exciting. When you're starting to have a basic understanding on how things works, especially, because then you can get creative with how you do your own stuff. I want to touch on the marketing part a little bit. If you're like me and watch a lot of content creator, you may be thinking that the way they market themselves is flawless, which is true, and you're going to be depressed when you're about to release your own songs, simply because you can't seem to market yourself the way they do it. It's just like everything. You have to have a personality first, and people will recognize that, then you can do things the way you feel like doing things and people will be okay with that. I'm a very introverted person myself so it is painful for me to open up myself to the world but at the same time when you do open yourself knowing that not everyone will like that personality of yours that makes it so much easier simply because you can just not care about who doesn't care about you. It's very liberating to think of it that way. Being a self-producer is a huge pain but when you have a goal, nothing seems to be impossible. Next question is from Jean Guib. Why does Traveler have a somewhat dark artwork despite of it being a rather uplifting song? Well, I'm glad you caught that. The thing that I had in mind for the first part of Adventures was something dark and unsettling. Well, not that dark, but like dark enough. I did indeed try to make the artwork more bright and cheerful for Traveler. But when I listened to the whole track, like the, the entire EP, it did not work very well for me. It felt wrong. So I had to go with this darkish artwork because it's kind of like introducing you to this dark and unsettling adventure. Honestly, I feel like it, it works that way. I think I made the right decision. It's all about the connection of all the tracks, I'd say. Next question is from Min. Mean. How did you learn to make music? I think your mixing is awesome. Thank you very much. I started out as a melodic dubstep producer. Actually, here's a little story. Back in 2013, I discovered parkour for the first time and thought it was cool and started practicing. Naturally, I would also watch a lot of parkour videos and the majority of tracks that have been used in those videos 
were mostly dubstep. I started to like the type of music and did some research and found out about that cool looking guy called Skrillex and became a fan. A friend of mine told me that you can make your own dubstep and uh, I was like holy cow how do you make that I need to know now and he was like there's a software called FL Studio and people make music with it that's when it all started FL 10 was my very first DAW it was hella confusing of course I also struggled a lot in terms of resources because like most people back then they usually make tutorials like how to sound like Skrillex or how to sound like blah 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 they would just show the process of how they made that specific sound as a beginner it was very frustrating because you just don't know what the hell is going on i've stumbled across many tutorials of that very kind i just couldn't figure out where to even start then i stopped making music for about a year and a half or more than that i can't really remember then after that, FL11 was released. I wasn't really into making music anymore at that time, but still wanted to check it out. The moment I opened it, it was a seamless, seamless project, Fit the Villa. I don't remember the title, but I played it and I was like, wow, people make this kind of thing in this very software? It was like the kind of music that I actually like. And that inspired me a lot. So I wanted to like make music again. I remember I would save a lot of sounds as presets in seamless projects and made my own small songs out of them. And uh, it was still bad. Well, of course. Then after two months, I was like, maybe that seamless guy makes more amazing music. I'ma check him out on YouTube. And uh, that was the best thing I've ever done in my life. I saw tutorials after tutorials after tutorials. It was quite overwhelming, to be honest. I remember I would go to Netcafes every single Fridays to download at least 15 videos on his channel. And when I get home, I would watch every single second of each videos two times a day. Also, he speaks kind of fast, but after watching the same video over and over again, I got used to the way he speaks so hooray, I guess. I've been doing that for 5 years straight, watching his videos and practicing and honestly, I don't regret it. Mixing wise, Seamless said that you should always high pass stuff that don't need low end to make room for the sub sub and the kick sub and also side chaining, those basic things I also learned from him. I'd say my mixing got a lot better recently mainly because of the remix and a lot of referencing. Next question is from Shoya. Yeah. Because next question is from Reversed. How did you do those tonal stabs in Wandering Steps? A bunch of layering. So this is how the sound sounds like. And this sound. Well, this is the main sound. A combination of two sounds. Then we have this consolidated pattern that has a volume automation on it, a slightly dispersed sounding sound, and then this lasery sounding saw wave, which is from Frozen actually, that also has volume automation. And then this granular sounding sound that I've made a while back this perky sounding sound some weird experiment but yeah also volume automation and lastly this bit crushed sounding sound that i also made so yeah next question is from oru how is you you is doing amazingly well next question is from Paki. when collab with the well, we did actually try to collab, but then I got extremely busy with all the YouTube videos and also this is Christmas 2020 because yes, it was back in 2020 and uh, yeah, that's the reason why it kind of stopped. Next question is from Navi Noor. How do you become alive? I really want to know. I guess just surround yourself with the right group of people and know how to vibe on your own. Next question is from Mello, more parkour? Indeed, I just don't want to upload them on YouTube anymore. I'll upload more on my Instagram instead. Burgar, 
purgar. Next question is from Noctane. Do you Greg? No, I man. Next question is from Wiu. Has your sound design or songwriting process changed over time? And if yes, how so? Both changed a lot actually. Sound design wise, I started to use granular synth more, FL stock and quanta, and also the way I use effects. Back then, I would just like do normal compression, distortion, filtering, and repeat the process, but now it's all over the place. Like, I just do stuff. For example, like a billion OTTs or phaser or whatever. And also, I started to resample more, which is really fun. That has to be like the biggest change. Songwriting wise, I'm thinking of uh, trying something new, but I'll keep it as a secret for now. When Burgar song, I've never thought of that actually, and I don't know why I should do that. And last question from Lisa. What is your favorite food? I don't really like or dislike a specific kind of food too much, but if I have to choose, I'd say I like sweet stuff more. I think that's about it. Thank you guys very much for watching. If you liked the video, please consider liking it and also consider subscribing. It helps your boy out. And yeah, if you still have some questions, post them on the comment. I'm, I'm going to try my best to answer them. And yeah, I'll see you later. Bye bye.